Yay, we are live. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Wherever you're joining us from, feel free to interact with us. We are very excited to be doing this. Um, uh, feel free to ask questions if you have them. Just jump in. I told you our guest is ready. Yes. But before then, let's introduce ourselves. Before you today is your girl, Chidi Akunda. And your G, Victor, Victor Akunda. Akunda. All right, so if you're new to our channel, this is Foundation for Family Affairs. Okay, our, our mission at Foundation for Family Affairs is to connect hearts and raise Re healthy family. families. And that's why we're so excited about what we'll be talking about today. I was speaking with someone um, earlier in the day and I was like, you know, it's the state of, our state decides the state and the, the family, in the marriage. Okay, our reactions to our children. And that's why I'm particularly excited about this. We'll be hearing more about you know, our emotions. Uh, should I say more? <laughs> okay, you, so I would, I would let the, the cat out of the bag. But our guest is ready. He is a child care coordinator Absolutely. with many years of experience, oh. many years of experience. And I mean, um, in our private talk with him, it was just interesting to hear some perspectives he mm -hmm. had to share. And he will be sharing some of them tonight. So you want to stay tuned? Do you want to take some feedback? Again? Yes, I'm so excited. Looking forward to this. Um, I hope you guys have your pens and papers. Oh, you yeah. know, just you know, share this. You know, send the link to anybody that you think would be interested in learning about how do we parents, you know, things about parenting, how do we protect our children from sexual abuse? What do we do to create a safe environment for our children so we don't regret? One of our posts says it is better to raise strong children than to repair mm. a broken adult. Okay. All right, by I think my uh, by Frederick. So it's very important for us to be able to create that atmosphere where when our children grow up, the stories they will share about their environment, about how they grow up, will be good news, mm. good stories, not story that you you know you'll be regretting because you can't really do much about it at that point. So share this link with different people you think will benefit from this. Any parent, anybody you know that's a parent or is an auntie to somebody or have overseeing responsibility over children, send this. I think they'll find this. Okay, so let's get our guest on now. He's super, super, super ready. <laughs> there he is. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Mr. Tunde. Thank you so much for coming on tonight. And we are really excited about what you'll be sharing. We are really keen to hear all of um, the perspectives you have to share. Fantastic, so, fantastic. Yeah, I'm excited as well. So thank you so, so much for having me here. Like I'm, I'm super pumped. Our pleasure. Awesome, awesome. We're very <laughs> happy to have you as well. Please, can you just introduce yourself? Tell us about what you do, how you do it, what's exciting about it, just tell us. Um, that's a dangerous question you just asked. <laughs> asked what's, what's exciting, what's exciting about what I do? <laughs> we could go on, what we could go on. and I'll probably even mention that a little bit. Um, but just a few things, um, just so you know, um, because it's morning here. So if I'm talking and I go this morning, this morning, so please just, yeah, just pardon me. There, you that's know, fine. I'll try, I'll try as much as possible to say this evening, you know, but that's if that comes up. Hey, so my name is Tunde Ojikutu. And um, I've been friends with the Akunas like almost forever. Like I can't even remember how long. Um, I think to jump into straight into maybe what I do and my work-wise i think it's great to have some bit of context and that's going to be my lived experience some of the experiences i had i remember that um as a, as a young person i i really i think my teen I remember my 14 or 15 i i really was a handful with my kids or with, with, sorry with my parents um it was it was full on so much so that um my, my my parents were like you know we're done like we're done one of them particularly was like look i'm done with you and i remember that i was chased out of the house and so i had to what they call couch sophie and i just found a name for her but i'll just say i was probably homeless for a bit mm. um yes for a while <clears throat> but what then happened was um somebody somewhere um just before when i entered university i met a few guys or some people, they were Christians, and yeah. what they did, or my interaction with them literally changed the trajectory of my life, because I really was yeah. was one of those really stubborn kids. And then, yeah. um, so with that interaction, then meant that um, uh, meeting them just, like I said, changed, changed the entire trajectory. 
and they believed mm. in me and and introduced me introduced me to to Jesus and and mm. it just really just changed everything for me. Um, now the impact of that though is that for me somebody gave me a chance, mm. right? and so uh, and that's what kind of um, precipitated my journey to say, look, mm. can I also give somebody this chance? Am I able to give? And so I did quite a bit of work um, volunteering in a in a religious charity, like most people will call them, or churches. Mm. And I did for a very long time working with youth. I started working with kids first, age mm. one and two, which was just so beautiful. So I could change nappies. I did everything way, way, way wow. ahead of time. Um, and then, and then there was a few during my talk. I'll mention a few things that that taught me. And mm. then I worked a whole lot with youth as well. So at some point, um, I, I decided to look, okay, I want to go to Bible college. So I, I came to Australia and then mm. attended Bible college for three years. And I kind of felt, yeah, okay, so I've gotten the spiritual part of that now. But mm. I cannot solve problems on a systemic level just by mm. knowing what I know alone, right? And so I decided I started a course in counseling and then mm. um, did a, uh, and then a, a master's in social work as well. And so it's the master's in social work that is that has been my my entry into that into this career so i have done this a bit and i work as what we call a case worker some people call that case worker or in my organization we call it a care coordinator and so that that's the work i do that's my professional work and all that just means is that i i would work with a whole lot of foster children that are not able to stay in their homes um, mm. I support them. I try to just make sure the best that we can as an organization within my organization, um, try to just make sure we get them a safe home, a place that mm. will hold up safety and security for the kids. And so that's that's the journey that has led me into my career at the moment. Mm. Um, yeah, that's it. Mm. I don't want to enjoy what I'm enjoying about my job because if I do, we won't even get into questioning. <laughs> that's all right. I'm sure it will come along the way as you keep talking yeah. and different things. You know, so um, there's one word when we we're preparing for this, there was one word that kept jumping out, you know, and um, mm. which we, and when we looked it up, different people had different perspective about it. So we want to know your own perspective. So, what's your perspective about the word safeguard? Ah, mm. oh, good, good one. Um, so with um, safeguarding, it, it will mean different things in different countries. Um, so, for example, I know places like the UK and Ireland and a few other countries use the word safeguarding. Um, but again, it doesn't even matter where it is. Sometimes in most of this, uh, in especially the professional sector, most of these words that, that sound big are actually very self-explanatory, like safe yeah. and guarding. Like yeah, it's, yeah. it's honestly that simple. And yeah. And, and the very simple thing, just a few things that I know would, would fall under safeguarding or what it means. It really just means things like protecting children from abuse and neglect. Um, mm. That's a very important part of that safeguarding principle, preventing harm to the child um, and just mm. making sure that the child's well-being is okay. But also more than that, safeguarding also means that you're able to empower a child to reach, to reach their potential. So it's not just I'm keeping safe. It also means I'm actually releasing them as well. Wow. So that's the part of it. And it's building, it's that culture you build around the child that actually is, that's mm. all those things put together. The healthy mm. culture, the safe time, allowing the child to participate in his own growth or in its own growth. These are all the things that we call safeguarding. And so mm -hmm. yeah, it's a big term, but really just it's just no more thing any child should need or any child would want. To be able to mm. just grow up holistically, so that's what that's what safety safeguarding is. Mm. Fantastic, fantastic. Want to ask him any questions? Yes. Uh, okay. So just taking it from there, then uh, I like the um, word you used, um, safety, mm. child safety. Mm. Okay. So how how can parents? Because we're talking about children now. How mm. can parents create an emotionally safe environment in a home? Wow, you went straight, straight for the juggler, straight in. <laughs> wow, okay. We well, might as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. That's a good point. Um, so with, with um, creating an emotionally safe environment for a child, there are quite a whole few, whole, whole lot of factors that come okay. into play. And I remember in our com my conversation with Victor, right? Um, I had to clarify a few things that. A number of times, most of the research that we cover, most of the research that we that we that we um, 
read or that we listen to, what happens is that the, we have to consider the context within which that person, right, which that person is doing that research. So, for example, if Tunde, a brown colored person that lives in Nigeria, you know, should do a research, my bias around that research, right, mm. is going to be things like my culture. Do you get what I mean? So that, that would play a very key factor in that. My education, uh, my socioeconomic status, for example, would, mm. would follow how I see the world. Now, it's mm. important that I say this because a whole lot of the research about things like safety for the children usually will come from Caucasian people that are middle class or, very, or, or high class people that are have rich or have that. And then it means that when they're looking at, at things like safety, it would come a lot of times. It would be measured from the. Um, it would be measured from a from their own bias. That's mm -hmm. the word I was looking for. Yeah, and so it's important to just to clarify that because when we say emotional safety, for example, some of the things that we're looking for is um, primarily is does the child feel safe enough? That's so important. Does the child feel safe enough to be able to go explore the world? Um, and also know, that's emotional, right? Does, and also know that they are safe enough to run back when what they see in the world is not exactly what they thought. Wow. So does the child know that there is a safe person, an adult, Hmm. that understands that is we call it i'm trying i wouldn't try as i was much as possible i wouldn't want to use academic terms but this one I just, just allow me we call it an attuned adult do we have an attuned an, an adult that is able to how do i put it an adult that can pick my emotions that understands where i'm at and so a safe environment for a safe environment or emotionally safe environment is a place where a child is not scared to fail i'll give you a quick example when kids, I remember growing up, if I fail maths or, no, let me know, if I break a plate, for example, I get failed. Mm. I mean, not in a bad way. That's most of us, most of us, most mm. of us kids. And it doesn't mean yeah. our parents hate us. And that's why I was talking about context. It doesn't mean they hate yeah. us. Maybe that's yeah. what they know. And so when you think about it, what then happens is that my head goes, if I fail, I better hide it. Mm. Because if not, I would beat him. So it's not the plate now. The, I know this area is just a plate. No, but what happens over time is that I begin to go, if I'm scared, I better not show it. If I'm, you know, if I'm, if I'm scared, better not show it. If I'm hurt, never, better not show it. Because So when you go to a store, think about this. When you go to a store and a child is throwing the tantrum, a number of times, what do you see the parents do? Yeah. What, <laughs> yeah. They get embarrassed. They're flustered. They're flustered. They want to yeah. get the child to shush, you know, to be quiet. Beautiful, which is so true. Now, it, where I'm from, I mean, where we are from, very likely we smack the child. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> right. So right. what we're telling the child, I know we're trying to just say stop making noise there, but no, because for children, they're not just, they don't think contextually, right? So like, oh, because of where I am is wrong. No, I don't want. So what happens is that the child then gets to this point where they begin to feel, no, if, if I'm unhappy with something, I better not say it because I better not show it. If I show it, I'll be beaten. Can you mm. see how that works? And so mm. these are some of the things that we, that, that some of the things that make for an emotional safety. Is the child, does the child feel safe enough to feel? Does the child feel safe enough to explore? Does the child feel safe enough or does the child know that there's an adult somewhere an adult somewhere that is attuned to their emotional needs. Mm -hmm. So basically, those are some of the things that make for an emotionally safe, emotionally mm -hmm. safe environment. Um, yeah, I'm providing that. Now, I don't want, I think I'll just take more questions because we can we can blow that up a little bit more. It's pretty very important. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, if you don't mind, um, and just stop me if you think we're spending too much. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead, sir. Right. right. So this is this is how it this is how it goes. When from the moment the child is born, right? And we know that. So I'm not even saying I'm not trying to sound smart or anything. This is just in just normal research. You get that on Google. Once the child is born, uh, and like from for most mammals, 
what happens is that you would see um, zebras and all those things we watch on our, on our, what's that thing called now, on Animal Planet and all those things. You see that once a child, once a baby animal comes up, it stays with the mom for a bit, not just, not just for, not so for a few things, one for sustenance, that's for food, but primarily it is for protection. Hmm. And that's the only way, that's the only way that um, it's called adapt adaptation. That's the only way um, animals continue to grow because as young babies, they, they stay safe with their parents. Hmm. Now, so what happens that in the case of us human beings, the problem with human beings doing like animals is that our own safety period that we need to stay attached to our adults is way longer than all other mammals. Yes. So what then happens is that once, once a child comes in, the child begins to understand his entire world through the eyes of his parents. Mm -hmm. So for example, what happens is while the brain is developing, the first part of the brain that starts is what we call the brain stem. It's just somewhere just at the back of the head. It's the first part. And that's what helps you to breathe and, and basically stay alive when you, in, those early, in those early stages when, you just, when you're born, the child is born. Mm. But the only problem there is that the interpretation of the entire world for a child only goes through that same brain stem. Now, what does that mean? When I see mommy running, I run. Mm. Mm. When mommy looks scared, then there's something scary happening. Mm. So a child interprets its entire world, that critical period that we call the very start of his years, usually they say up to two months first and all the way to two years, interprets the entire world through what he sees. And so when mommy is smiling, that's why it's so important. When mommy is smiling with the child, that means safety, that means fun. When mommy is angry or, or when the child, even at two years old, experiences domestic violence, not the child, but sees daddy and mommy fighting and mommy is stressed. The child is then interpreting and beginning to make something we call the internal working models. Like in the, the child is beginning to world a worldview. Or, yeah, this is what the world looks like. This world that I've come into, it's wow. filled with hate. It's filled with pain. Oh no, it's filled with love. Everybody's kind. Everybody mm -hmm. smiles at me. So imagine a child, a child born in wartime. Just imagine how unsafe the child would be. So yeah. it's so yeah. important because it's our duty to make sure, it's the best way that we can, make sure that all what we're trying to let our child see, I mean, that or the child gets this sense of safety at the very, at the very start. Yeah. And that safety leads to something we call attachment. And there's, a, there's one, if, if you can, please, everyone, if you can, just Google what we call att attachment theory. It's a short read, but it's probably one of the most phenomenal theories when it comes to trying to raise your child. Because now we know from research that the first few years of a child, the attachment the child has to a primary caregiver, and that is mom, dad, it doesn't matter. As long as there's one primary caregiver, it could even be grandma, it doesn't matter who. Once a child finds that secure attachment, it affects his job later in the future, definitely affects, affects his relationship, in fact, a whole lot of things, all the way to his health, to the baby's health, by the time the child is age 50 and more, has been traced a whole lot to that attachment that happens at the very same, at the very beginning. And so it's very important that at the start, as much as we can, try to get that sense of safety for the child. Okay, I think I've gone on a, a, too long. But... No, no, really fantastic. No, really fantastic. You are in, com completely in line. No, no. And what I'm getting from this is that a healthy parent has a long has a lot to do with a healthy child. Mm. Oh. In other words, it, the question is: you are saying that our emotional states can influence how our children turn out. Mm, yes. Is that oh. correct? Yes, and that, and so let me. I'm going to qualify that just to say our emotional state because our emotional state for us is a really it's a key thing. So your emotional state literally affects everything. So it's mm -hmm. so I'll be careful not to just say it's only parenting that it affects. If it affects mm. a whole lot. And that was what I was trying to explain with that child. And I said what the child sees. Mm. And so, so one of the things, um, if you don't mind, if you want me to segue into this, even though you have not necessarily asked the question, is the issue of the social economics and culture of mm. is that a good yeah. one? All right. Yes. So yeah, so when we go into something like social, the social economic status, just a way to just say 
um, is the, if they're rich. So if a parent has enough money or not, or the mm. now let me just clarify again that social economic status does not only mean money. It doesn't only mean that it's the parental income. There are a whole lot of factors that make up for what we call social economic um, status. So, for example, access to services as well is some of the things we would look at. Um, what kind of labor they live in. So that is income might be good, but he's living in a very, very bad place or in a place where there's no safety for the child. So there's a whole lot of factors that come in. But yeah. however, there is no direct science that tells us that poor parents cannot bring up healthy kids. Mm. Even though a whole lot of the science says that there's a direct link between SES, social economic status, and parenting. But there are a whole lot of factors around that that work. For example, so it's not that it's the money that or the income that affects the child directly. It's because lack of income causes stress for parents. So it is the stress that is affecting the child and not necessarily the lack of money. So, for example, if I, I mean, we, we know people that lived in villages that did not even know anything about a whole lot of things in the West or in, in cities, right? And they grew up to be super healthy. And dad would go to the farm and they would, and they, would, they were just, sust I mean, they were sustain sustainable or sustained by, by their farming. And that, and that was mm -hmm. perfect. And that was okay. They didn't need to do anything extra. Mm -hmm. Now. And so, and that's because in that place, maybe they just didn't feel the stress. If I wanted water, I go to the stream and that's fine. And there's no problem. If I want food, I always have fresh food. I go to the garden, I get it. If I want chicken, I catch a live chicken and I'm done and everyone ate well. And so it's not the direct bit. It's not the direct link between money and parenting or economic, economic status and parenting. But it's the other things that lack of a good income as it were for one of them or not living in a safe society causes. And that mm. affects the emotional state of parents. Mm. So if dad and mom cannot stay at home because they need to work five jobs, they come, there's no way they get home and keep smiling at junior, right? Because they're super stressed. Now the stressed state is what then affects the child. Do you get that? Lack of time affects the child. That's poor mental health or mom's poor mental health then affects the child because that is that is stress that has now that that has that has got acute stress disorder or any of the disorders that are there. So emotional state affects, yes, it will affect your parenting. It's inevitable. You cannot separate it. Mm -hmm. So when the child is saying or trying to show when the child is crying, what we don't know is that because the child does not have the words as adults. Remember I said it's just the brainstem that has started to grow. Um, that's where it goes. And then there are other bits, limbic system, and then we come to the prefrontal cortex. Let me just say something about the prefrontal This place, the top of your head, or the brain, sorry. Now, your what we call your reasoning, to be able to use language properly for you to, I put deductive reasoning, it's called, uh, what's, the, what's the implication of my, what's the implication of my action? Um, what, all that only comes from access to your, for your your cortex, your prefrontal cortex. Now we know for a certainty now that your that part of your brain does not get the fully developed until you're 25, around that 25. Wow. So when you are telling when you are telling a six year old child to behave as an adult, why did you do that? You can see you are asking them to do something that they are not biologically mm -hmm. able to do. Yes. So why yes. scream? If a child is in the supermarket throwing a tantrum because, or, or you say maybe the child is playing, and then you say let's go home, and the child starts to cry, and daddy gets upset. But the problem is the child is not crying because they want to. But that's the way the child understands to say I don't want to end the fun yet, right? But daddy yes. goes no, and they either smacks the child, or pulls the child, or is not attuned to what the child is trying to say. Yes. So, yes, emotional state, whatever emotional state you are in, does affect your parenting. That was a long way to answer that short question you asked, but hey. <laughs> awesome. 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 Yeah. Thank you so much. And I mean, uh, viewers have been trying to, you know, chime in. You've been hitting it really big. Uh, we've had some um, great um, feedback. Just one of them is relationship builders firm saying, hmm, true, a child's mind is a plain canvas. Mm -hmm. What parents model is painted on the on that canvas? We must mm -hmm. be intentional 
about what we showcase to our children. That's just one of them. And um, I think um, Bolanle Oladejo saying, an attuned adult, someone who understands. So you've been dropping it really hot and it's going in. We're really enjoying it. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank I'm, you for I'm that. Glad. I'm really glad. Um, and can I just also add something now? Sorry about this, though. Yes, please. You know, we said the parents paint the picture on the canvas, right? All right, so just to just clarify that there's some signs that say really that children do not have the full blank slate, but that's fine. So it's, um, that's blank, but it's even okay. That's not even the point. Now, but this is this is where it comes that the painting that the children, that, the, that parents paint on the canvas, right? Just understand that that painting comes from what has been a lot of time what has been painted on their own canvas. Hmm. And it is so, so important. And, and I know most of people may have heard this word that they call transgenerational trauma or intergenerational mm -hmm. trauma, meaning mm -hmm. that the trauma that dad and mom face, if, even though a whole lot of times they all go, it will never happen to my child. I would never make this. But you see, that's the problem there is that, you remember I said when the child grows up, all the things he expresses creates a world model, a worldview, internal working model for the child the kind of attachment the child has, all those things come together. Now, what has happened is that dad does not know that he thinks he gets, yeah, you know, I'm in control, mom, I, I'm in control of everything. But in actual mm -hmm. fact, it's that model that they have that they also give to their children. Mm -hmm. And so that is why it's so important that parents, as much as they can, either talk to someone and say, you know what, let's reflect. What was my growing up like? Mm -hmm. If my growing up was all fun and all happy, then it's very, very likely that you're going to be giving that to your children. Mm. If you were, if you had a really, really, really traumatic childhood, something they call um, adverse childhood experiences and all those things, if you have a whole bit, there's a high possibility. Now, I'm careful not to say you, it must happen, but I'm saying that there's just a higher probability or possibility that you're also going to be doing the same thing to your child even though it's not your main intention. And so there's a part where parents have to just look back, okay, why am I beating this child? And I'm saying beating carefully because in, in where we're from, it's not seen as illegal for you to smack your child. Yes. Yeah, and I'm careful that the number of people that are on this are from that part of, of, of the world, you know? And mm. so that's from our, my, my country, Nigeria. Um, so why am I, okay, why do I get frustrated when my, my child comes home with English F9, why, why do I get frustrated? And it's pretty simple. One of the reasons, even though we were, is because as young kids, we had this, we had this, um, there was this expectation on us. You better pass everything in school. If you don't, you don't play during the holiday, right? Remember, you're going to be doing lessons all through the holiday. Yes. So while the intention was good, the problem is that we then put an expectation on dad and on I mean, on the parents when they were kids that mm. anything less than perfection means you are not up to standard. Wow. So dad grows up and we're going to see that in daddy's work because that's what, remember I said it's an internal working model. Wow. Yeah, I'm not saying dad because, okay, so let me say mom as well. So uh, be careful. So yeah. you see that in the parents. So parents would also get to work. They'll see in their friendships, they want to be the best at everything. In school, they want to be the best because remember, they've said at home, if you don't get A1 in everything, you're not going to be good enough, even though mm -hmm. they didn't verbally say that. So the parents go to work and they experience that. We do what we call KPIs and we do our performance appraisals and all those things. And the whole idea is you have to be very, you have to be top notch. If not, you're not good enough. So mm -hmm. imagine everything around them has reinforced that, that statement. Now we then go home and then your child comes up with F9. That you mm -hmm. see that the only thing you have known is that no, F9 is bad. And I'm not saying F9 is good, you know what I mean? But I'm just trying to say, but F9 does not mean you failed English. It means you are a failure. Mm -hmm. And it's so important that we understand the difference between and, and that shame and guilt is the worst thing, the worst, one of the worst test thing, if you allow me, to ever put on your children. Mm. It's the worst. Because children find meaning in life by acceptance. It is so important. 
that they feel accepted. And you look at that all through. Children find that when they're accepted in friends, in school, when they go to school and they have great friendships and they do all that, the child comes home happy. When they're home and they're accepted, they find they're happy. When they're dating and when they grow up and they're teenagers and they're doing boyfriend and girlfriend and they're accepted by whoever they're, they're with, it, it means a whole lot. And you can see where acceptance is so key. So the moment you bring shame into a child's life, now the difference between shame and guilt is this. Shame says, I am not, I am bad. I am a failure. Guilt is, I have done something I should have done better. I have done something that I shouldn't have and I, I deserve the result. That's guilt. That's guilt. Now, guilt is in quotes better, but either way, we shouldn't even put both on kids because as mm. kids, they're all just learning. And so I just, my bit is that, you know, let's, let's, let's start to see how we can work around that. Quick one. I have a friend, very good friend that um, the kid's a little bit different in school. He's super smart, but would not, would not um, go through the standard process of let's read. So he probably won't read all through the semester, but would ace school. Now, the parents are worried a little bit that how come he's not reading, he's not reading, he's not reading. I go, okay, I get it. But what if reading that way is just not the child's style? What if? So can we as parents, and that's our job, is there something we can do as parents? Can we work it with audio work? Will can we can we make it more fun? I met a couple. I met a couple here in, in Australia like two months ago. All their kids, they have five kids, and they're on Facebook. They're really awesome guys. Five kids. None of the kids go to school. I'm like, are you kidding me? Why? Instead, they call it live schooling. Just so you know, I met these kids and I was like, wow. These kids, we could co had conversations about almost, and we had conversations about almost anything. And they were way above average for most of the kids I'd worked with. What do they do? They're traveling around. They travel around. All they've been doing is traveling around. So they teach mathematics by this, by cooking. So when they are measuring quarters and doing all those things, so how many we need for one, for one cake, we need, um, say, one cup of flour. But we want to do a quarter of a cake. So how do we do it? And then the kids work that out. They go fishing and then they learn things about life skills and, and different things. And they learn science by putting coke and something that explodes the whole thing. And, and, the, 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 and, and I've seen this work for these people. What I think, and I asked the parents why, they said, oh, their children were struggling a whole lot in school. So you can see, can you see how that you've created a safe place for that child to be able to go, you know, I struggled in school, but my dad and my parents found how to reorder the world or whatever mm -hmm. it is, irrespective of what people were saying, to make sure that I become, that um, my, my, that my well-being was fine or safe. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sure Fantastic. you know. Fantastic. Wow. Please, let's keep the comments coming. Yeah. If you have questions, post your, your questions. We'll definitely respond to them. One key thing that you said that really got me, and it's never left my, me for a while, attuned adults. Mm -hmm. So you can have an adult in the room, but they may not be attuned to the emotional need of the child. Wow. That is, I, and I would just say for, for wow. most parents, now in my in my um, work line of work, that's usually the difference. Is mm -hmm. and, and again, that's why I'm saying that money itself or socioeconomic status does not necessarily mean good parenting. Mm -hmm. A key factor for parenting is actually being attuned. So when my child is screaming, remember that, like I said, kids as babies, right? Especially all the way to age two, do not have the language, not yet. You can see kids are saying Baba at two, right? They don't have the language to express their words and exp express, express their, their, yeah, the feelings that they have. And so they default to something laughing or crying, right? Or... Because the child can't tell the difference between frustration and anger, they can't. There's no, there's no word for it. even adults find it hard to use the difference between what's frustration and what's anger. They don't even know, right? And mm. then you're like, I'm feeling, I'm angry at the moment. No, you're not angry. You might be frustrated, but not angry. But mm. I don't know, I don't know that. so now imagine a two-year-old having to walk through the complexity of language. Wow. Right. Now, so just it means therefore that as a parent, or even as even if you're not a parent, as that uncle as that, let me just say caregiver, what would happen is that we, you, you give that child some bit of safety when 
you can when the child is frowning, you can tell um, something is wrong, something is not happy, or something is not happy, and then you you stop what you need to do. Like I, I know everything is a whole lot, but one minute, what's happening? Um, let me just imagine the child's name is Victor. Hey, Victor, what's happening to you? Uh, I doesn't know, just crying. And Victor can doesn't have words. Remember. And then if you notice another parents will start asking, are you hungry? Are you this thing? Are you this thing? And then when, when we hit it, the child goes, yes. And then we go, yeah, and then we can meet the child's need. But you see, without that time, that's what we call attunement. That's what, where you are tuned to the child's need. You, you can help sense that and you help the child explain what he's going through. Mm-hmm. You get it, and so and so that bit, and that, and and that's the thing. So once you don't have, once a child is not, so in in the West, right, when children are taken away from their homes for a whole lot of reasons, abuse and all that, and some of them are really very bad. So when the child has to be taken away from home, what we would do, like my organization, is to make sure that we find that whoever we are placing them is not just someone that wants to do it. Oh, I love to be a foster carer. That's great, but. Are you attuned? Do you understand what it is like when a child has been through so much? They're taking a mm. child from mom. The child is already walked up and has all the trauma-induced symptoms and presentations. You know what I mean? Yes. You, would you be the one to do you understand that when this child is screaming and, and trying to and breaking the wall, that the child is not is not necessarily saying, I hate your house or I hate you, even though the child will say, I hate you, you're the worst person, you're the devil. But are you going to take time to go, hey? This child is saying something. What's happening? Now, that is attunement. So you find a way to, to make the child regulate and, okay, calm down. Now, tell me what was happening. Mm. And then the child goes, I was angry, blah, blah, blah. I don't I, I didn't like it when people say no to me. Okay, now let's walk through this. You can't always get yes. But so over the next six months, we're going to work together on how to accept no. I'm just using that as pretty simplistic. And so that's mm. what attunement is. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. Um, you've really done justice to emotional safety. Can yeah, we talk yes. a bit about how to create a sexually safe environment? Ah, oh, that's a very, very big one. Um, okay. and so so with that one, and I like that you brought that immediately after emotional. The key reason is that if a if a child feels emotionally safe, right? then it's Mm -hmm. way easier for you to provide a sexually safe environment for the child. Now, I know that a lot of times we just want to jump, oh, because there are a whole lot of abuse around now, we want to jump straight into, let's, let's, how do we get a sexually safe environment for the child? Now, the truth is that you cannot successfully do that. And I say that almost, you cannot successfully do that if you have not learned how to get an emotionally safe or you have not attempted at least to get an emotionally safe space for the child. And so some of the things and some key factors that I know would help, um, I'm not going to be, I wouldn't say I'm the expert on this one. I know there are a whole lot of people. I know there's someone, there's a friend, common friend that we have. I know um, Praise for where I remember early on that Praise had this um, sexuality education thing for kids. Where from the very start, and, and the good thing about that, that what he had, and I don't have any information about it, is that it was, they were age appropriate. Some things right. you would do at age one, some things you should start doing at age two, and you let the child know, for example, that right. uh, nobody should, these are, these are your private parts, this is a place nobody should touch. Um, yeah. You understand? Yeah, when you're taking your bath, this is it. No, no, um, if any adult touches you in any way at, at an appropriate age. Um, Let's let let mommy know. But you see, the problem is if the child does not feel that I can tell anything to mom, and mom will smack, and mom will not smack me, then the child knows that if one person touches me wrongfully or inappropriately, you know, then the child knows I can run to mom because mom is that safe space. We call it mom is that safe space where I can run to go complain or someone touch me in a way. And then another bit about getting that um, sexual um, a sexually safe environment for a child is for us to understand that bit of, we have to, children by default will be inquisitive as they grow older. Yeah. That's the only way, and let me tell you, that's the only way our, our not generation, or let me just use the word general, our species is the word. That's the only way our species, it's in, it's in them. And so at an age appropriate level, it's okay for you to have those conversations before. 
Now, I would already even advise that by the time you're getting to age seven, that, I mean, I won't be talking about where babies come from, although they would ask you already. They would already mm -hmm. ask you that usually where the babies come from. But I would already start advising that you start talking about things about parts of their body. Like, in fact, seven is probably too late. And because when they get to school, now that at seven, they're, they're, they're most likely in year two or something. So when they get to school, they're going to have other kids that probably have either been exposed to things that are inappropriate. And then they start to talk about those things. Now, when they come to meet mom and dad and they go, hey, what is, what is, let me say, what's pornography, for example? I'm just going to use that. At age seven, mm. daddy or parents just go, no way, no, don't. You should, why should you do that? But we lose that opportunity to go, wow, okay, let's talk about it. So you see, mm -hmm. male and female, blah, blah, blah. And then remember, it has to be age appropriate. Mm -hmm. So I'm not the best person for that. I would advise that you please do ask um, someone like, like I said, there's material like from people like Praise for Where that have done a whole lot of work on age appropriate content. Now, the other issue should then be, what would happen when, say, my child has been exposed? Now, that bit we can talk about. If my child has been exposed inappropriately to, say, sexual content or there's been, um, there's been disclosure of abuse, see, more than anything, what's most important to the child is safety. More than anything, it's the child's safety. Um, um, and one of the bits, I'm sorry, so somebody has just put up that open conversations are very important. Honestly, you couldn't have said that better. Um, yeah, Bolandi also put that up. And I just feel that well, that's very, very important because that was where I was actually going with this. Like um, creating that safe space for the child to be able to, that they, when the child knows that they can come back home to come mm -hmm. talk to parents. Mm -hmm. um, a very common case would be when kids, especially where we're from, if a child says, uncle has abused me, we either tell the child to shut up, mm. you're lying, very, very likely we're going to go, very likely we're going to go, it's not true, or why are you making this up? So already the child feels, I'm not safe outside because somebody's going to be touching me, but someone's doing something that is not okay to me. Mm. But then I'm also safe at home. Now put yourself in that particular situation. Ask the child, what would you do? Remember already I said that the front part of the brain where they can think about what to do or not to do is not even fully developed yeah. so the problem then comes how then do they do so more than anything it's that conversation i had a major shock when i came i mean in the west it's a major shock for me still a 13 year old for example i have a friend that has a 13 year old that just started um, high school and i go he goes um oh my, my daughter is coming home and she's bringing her boyfriend and i'm like what? what? Oh, you know, I'm like, now I, I get that culture, right? That's going to be my a major shock for most of us. But you see, I took some time to reflect and I go, we have two options. Child feels it. I mean, most of us just think the moment we hear boyfriend, girlfriend, that it means there's something inappropriate happening. That's not true. That is definitely not true. You would see eight or seven year olds that go, yeah, this person is my boyfriend. This person is my girlfriend. It doesn't mean there's anything. It just means, oh, I have something special with this person. I can talk to this person. We spend time with that person a whole lot. Now, this child, has, I, my thought is this in the West. We have an option. Tell the child to never do that. And guess what? The child goes, does it anyway, because that is what the child will do at that age. They're like exploring, right? Does that outside the room? Or we provide a safe space where while you are exploring, there's a place for you to, there's a place I can, as an adult, Put the barriers for you mm. already as an adult so that mm. when you are when you are 13 or 12 and you're still playing and tinkering with uh, boyfriend girlfriend come and then i'll show you guys that this is this is the safe way to do it it's fine for you to be friends with somebody but you can be alone but you can what you're watching you know and all this and you teach them together do you, you know what I mean? I'm not saying that you're saying that you're married forever, you know, they are going to be married, but I'm just saying that you're yeah. creating a safe place for that yeah. child to flow. Remember, yeah. I said at the start that emotionally safe means the child feels I am safe enough to go explore, and yeah. then I'm, I'm, I know there's somebody waiting for me at home when I am distressed for my exploration. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's what I think about creating that sexually safe place. Hmm. Okay. Um, 
we have a question here. I, I just think we should take it so um, we don't miss it. Uh, so Stephen here is saying, hi, today. should personality differences in kids affect how we interact with each of them? Wow. Uh, that's that's a great one. Um, the very good yeah. thing is that I know who's asking the question. Is my friend here in Australia? So that's really good. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Still, we'll sort this out later. But yeah, but on a very good, <laughs> on a very good note. So let's see. Um, the personality difference of the kid now. Um, how should we should that change how we as parents interact with our child? Or I'm going to also focus on that bit where he says each of our each of them. Now, two words that I know I've used here. Number one safe space safe space right mm -hmm. um now it's so important one of the things that irrespective of a child's personality the child must know that with my parents i am safe mm -hmm. irrespective of the personality and that means i'm getting as much time as my extroverted so let's just imagine that i'm extroverted if i'm extroverted i'm usually more likable that's the truth because i'm party i'm jumpy i'm all that right mm -hmm. Now, but an attuned, which is the other word I'm saying, an attuned parent understands that I kept, that the the joy, the jovial nature of my of one of my kids should not take the space of my more quiet child. Mm -hmm. you, you get what I'm saying? And yes. so how we interact with the child may be different, but the very essence of it that is providing that safety for mm -hmm. the child. And remember that um, at the start, I explained what safety is going to be like. And that is protection, protection from the child from abuse and neglect, irrespective of the child's personality. Prevent the child, ensure that the child has a, is healthy and, um, and has proper well-being, right? Ensure that the child has a voice in decisions. So what do you want to do today? As against, this is what we're going to do. So for an extroverted child, for example, and Steve, this is the part where how we interact with them will be different. For an extroverted child, an extroverted child might probably go, the best day ever is just sitting down together and reading a book. Mm -hmm. Now, I promise you, for an extroverted child, there is no way that is going to be the fun thing. The fun things were outside throwing the ball or we're in the park <laughs> doing something. Now, mm -hmm. so it then becomes, how then do I ensure? And that's where the voice of the child is important. How do I ensure, and this communication, where I go to the extroverted child, okay, how about we do one hour outside to so let the child know that he's so important and it's okay for his personality. Now, but do we agree together that once we're done, we're both going to sit down and then let's also give this person attention, this young child attention. Now, I mean, you won't say it that way. Let's spend time with Victor and let's do it together. Because we're a family, we do things together. Mm. now one thing is that you're first meeting the emotional needs of the child but other than that you're also teaching the extroverted child that the world is not only about them that mm. it's also key that they learn to care for people because guess what very likely an extroverted child is going to very likely marry an introverted person mm. if they don't mm. learn from the start as a child how to how to accommodate all that then that's where we have some of the issues that come up later as they grow, one person's jumping too much and does not know how to accommodate the, the, the difference of other people, either in school or in marriage or in relationships. And so, yes, it will affect how we are, how we work with, interact with our children, different personalities, but the essence of it is the same, that I mm -hmm. prefer, I'm attuned to whatever child's temperament it is, but mm -hmm. I'm also providing a safe space. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Stephen. I hope I, I, I know that answered your question because I, I gleaned a lot from that. Yeah. So if you have, if you guys have more questions, please keep them coming. Keep them coming. You can see a lot of people are online. Yeah, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate you. Let us know where you're watching from, all right? We just heard that Stephen is watching from Australia. Let us know where you're watching from. Just, you know, type it in the comment section, the UK, Nigeria, wherever you're watching from, let us know, okay? Let us know where you're watching from. Okay, so um, many things you've talked about now. Uh, from the last point you made, you did say mm -hmm. that the essence is the same, that we have to keep. But you're going to change how you respond to them based on their personality. And you even went far, far to give like a structure, an idea of how, okay, you can play outside, now you can come inside, so that the mm -hmm. other child will not feel like 
this one is getting the whole attention. But that's what some children uh, often see because the child who is the loudest, who is jumping everywhere, is getting the whole attention. And this child that is just quiet and just reserved, being the good child in quote, is not getting any form of attention. And so, in the child mind, like you said, they don't have the capacity to process the situation. They may begin to say, oh, maybe this child is more important. Dad and mom likes or loves this child more than me. And children like that, they don't voice their thoughts. They internalize. And so you see sometimes children just um, growing with this esteem that, oh, I'm not important. Okay, let me try to behave like my brother so that they will like me. So different. So I really like the way you talked about the practicality of how parents should navigate this reality. Because if you have more than one child, there's a probability they will have different uh, personality. So how do you navigate that? And what structure can you use to be able to create so that you, as, as a parent as well, you will be attuned? Mm -hmm. Because every personality, every child will have, will have specific needs, yes, different right. needs. Yeah, yeah, and we can't use the same template for them. So yeah. having said that, um, You've been in Africa, you've been in, the, in Australia. What are the major differences in the parenting style? And what, what, what would be your comment to that? Well, I'm trying to see if I have the authority, the, the whole authority to talk on that. Um, that's experiential. So I don't know. I would think that, look, um, one of the things that we discussed at the time was the impact of culture. Hmm. I know we didn't spend a whole lot of time because we, we, we spoke a lot of that emotional safety because that's very key. Now, the truth is that culture as it is has an impact on how we parent a, a whole lot. Now, the funny thing, though, is that one of the, in fact, two of the parents that I've seen have probably, I can say, the most phenomenal parents. You know, if I one of them, so I met I met the child first. I met the child. Um, when I mean child, I mean your do, do, sorry, the daughter, um, this person's daughter, um, first. She's about my age or older. So when I'm saying daughter, I don't mean a young girl. Um, and then I met her parents, and honestly, in right I, here in Australia, I mean, they are like the best parents I know. I'm not even joking. They are super phenomenal parents. Um, in fact, I have adopted them as my parents. Like wow. I just did automatic. They didn't have choice on that one. I'm like, I'm going to love you. I am going to so love you. Now, the very interesting thing is that I have seen in that particular relationship that let me call it transgenerational pass down as well. Hmm. Now, this the daughter that I met at first. I met her husband. I love those people too. For I've met they have four kids. I'm yet to find in Australia. Maybe there will be like well-behaved kids, super well-behaved. I'm talking about adults. Two of them are adults, some, yeah, just young kids kids in school. The adults are super respectful. They, and, and then they're Christians, and I, I know there's that bit that religion will play as well, but you see them, they, they, they would honor people that are older than they are. And I'm talking about um, Caucasian Australians, just so right. you know. So I'm not saying that maybe it's a Nigerian family here that they've taught them, you know, how you never talk to an old person. No, no, no. These yeah. are but super awesome people. Now, back home as well, we, and I'm sure a whole lot of us, a whole lot of us know people that are just awesome parents. Mm. So, I, so I guess the question, and why I have given both examples, it, it, will, it will be, or is that, sorry, we need to be careful when we are comparing places. Mm. Because I know one of the conversations we had, and I say that, and, and I mentioned that um, as well about, research that you read is that context is so 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 important what is acceptable in your country that would make for good parenting may not be acceptable in australia or in any or in the west or any other country at all and so to then try to draw a straight parallel between how is parenting in australia and how is parenting is might not exactly be the fairest unless we pick say well for example how is disciplining in in australia compared to that because parenting mm. is a very, very big concept. Mm. It's so hard for you to do some kind of research that would say, this is how it is in Africa and it's better here in Australia. There are a whole lot of things you can learn from each other. Now, this mm. couple I told you about, the very the ones here in Australia that I feel are just phenomenal, the two generations of, of parents, right? One of the things I know is that you would see them set very strict standards for their kids. Not very strict, but good boundaries for their kids. Very good. 
In fact, I remember mom saying, oh, if her kids, that's the, the, the daughter I met, that when, when her kids were younger, if they misbehave, she smacked them. No, not so it's smack is not bring cane like you know, smack would be stop it, you know. Something that's what that's what oh, you both call smack. I'm like, you want smack? Come over to me. <laughs> you. Africa, you see what smack is, you know, like what we smack now, yeah. But really, so it's not not violent again, it's not violent smacking. Yeah, now, one of the things I noticed though, is that you have the same boundaries that she said, she said routine for her children as well. That it, that that helps all kids. So either in Nigeria or anywhere else, right? In Africa mm -hmm. or anywhere else. Some of the things that are important, if you set those things, routine for ch all children need routine. That's about the only way we're able to make sense of the world as well. So mm -hmm. routine to make them grow, love and care to know I have an emotionally safe place. So irrespective of where you are, if you're able to set those things up, I think parenting for you is going to be a win. Be aware of the legal limit, legal structures where I'm legal, yeah. yeah, the laws around where you are. That is mm -hmm. so, so important. Because I work in out of home care, I work in out of home care. I have seen places where children have been taken from their home um, mm -hmm. because the government saw it as abuse. While culturally, I know that for a certain that culturally, that would not have been considered abuse in the, in the family. Do you get what I mean? That mm -hmm. would not have been that would not have been abuse in that family. But mm -hmm. again, the law of the land proceeds. Like, hey, do not do this. You know, do not. These are some punishments you can. You're not allowed to give your child. But then, mm -hmm. and so again, let's just be careful when we're doing this kind of um, uh, comparisons because context is totally different. And mm -hmm. what's at yeah, that's key. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. And I think you kind of delve into the next question we have for you, which is, uh, why do some immigrant parents lose their children to social services? Uh, good one. So because that, that's where I'm working at the moment. So that's a okay. really, really, really good question. Um, so but just to clarify, I only have data for, I mean, the data I've looked at is only data from, from Australia. So it means, therefore, that what I'm saying is just specific to Australia. I don't know what it's going to be like in the UK or globally. Um, for example, we don't have in Nigeria an active. So if there is, I don't know about it. We don't have an active child protection service. Okay. And that's if we have. I don't, I'm not sure. I know the laws, but I don't, I'm not sure that we have yeah, this kind of safeguarding child protection or safeguarding um, practices. Now, so one of the things, for example, with, with immigrants or people that come in, um, number one, the data show doesn't show us that a whole lot of them lose their kids here in Australia. Interestingly, it's more the, a number of the people that lose their kids or to not lose, sorry, lose is not even the best word. So let's be careful with that one. I apologize for that. So lose yeah. is not it. Um, that, um, Okay, yeah, that parental rights are given to to the to to the state social, social services, yeah. yes, to the state. Yeah. That, yeah, so a number of them that a number of them that are usually more locals, that's citizens. Um, yeah. In in a place like Australia, we have some we call the First Nations people, um, and a whole lot that happens to them. So that people, indigenous people, and so a whole lot of them. That's what happens now with the immigrants, though, because I have worked with a few here, like um, personally. And a major issue is culture for them. Culture is one bit, but another important bit, especially for immigrant parents, either by refugee status or by choice, a number of times is stress. Remember we spoke about the emotional state of, of people. Now think about it. As parents, you've stayed a whole lot in Africa, wherever it is in Africa, and then you move to a new place. Now, not only for the child is it different. I've lost all my friends. Just remember that. For kids, I remember that acceptance for kids is so key not mm -hmm. just at home but even in their even in their own sectors right i mean in their own small groups or whatever mm -hmm. now i think that so kid kid is already uh what's happening to my world but dad and mom are also feeling the same i mm -hmm. used to work as md in an office somewhere now i'm working casual work now just ima imagine a few of those things new environment, I'm feeling lonely, I don't have my family to fall back on. So you can see all that puts some bit of stress on parents. Mm -hmm. Now, a number of times, the thing that then happens is that, so child then acts up, then dad gets super stressed, mm -hmm. and then that stress may be taken out on the kid, either by neglect, either not neglect, neglecting the child or abusing the child or harm, in any way it is. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And then in a society like the West, where you are, social services is called. Somebody's going to report that. Someone that sees that reports it. And they're not reporting that you should come take the child. They're reporting that this child needs to be protected. So what mm-hmm. social services would do is go in there to go, hey, what's happening? Is this safe enough for the child? When they see that it is not safe enough for the child, and there are factors that they check. It's not just, is this safe? No, take the child out. The factors they check, number one, they try to work with parents. Okay, we understand that you're immigrants. How can we support you? Now, if they then see that the if they see that it continues, that that the child is still someone we call the risk of significant harm, that there's a possibility that the child is still facing the risk of significant harm. The law here, or the law in most Western societies, would say you have you it's mandated you have to take the child away from that environment, not because you want to separate the child but because you need to make sure the child is safe. Mm-hmm. It's the responsibility of a state to take care. And so immigrant children, I don't think it's because of it's, it's because they are different. I know the culture plays a bit, but it's also the bit that there's the stress usually of moving around, and that usually would add to the stress of parenting. Parenting alone is stress, right? Now add moving away, and so child, everybody's mm-hmm. dysregulated, and then those are some of the things that happen. Yeah. But mm-hmm. yeah, it's so just to clarify, social services do not target immigrant parents. Like, you know, this is it. Yeah, it's it's so okay. important that we do that. It's just cultural and checking the legal place that you are. That's it. Fantastic. Yeah, this is why I think it's important for parents who are um looking at venturing out, um, mm-hmm. relocating, mm-hmm. Uh, doing what's at stake, what is involved. Okay, because sometimes, like you were saying, stress. They're not really prepared for what they meet mm-hmm. in the countries they move, they move to. And then, of course, relocation comes with its own demands. Mm-hmm. So with you trying to settle in, trying to find your fit, um, find a job, uh, sort out the children, get them settled in a school, it could put a lot of weight on uh, the family financially, could put a lot of weight on the family emotionally. Okay, And then um, it just sometimes skyrockets. So we need to be very prepared for that. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So having looked at that, looked at that, um, there's a question that also came to our mind while we're looking at this. To say, in this yeah. line of work, you yeah. work with different people, you work with immigrants, you work with syndicates, you work with uh, locals. So, what has impacted you the most, and why? Uh, that's uh, that's a really good one. Um, so in the in the work that I do, which is social social work, basically. And that is, um, as, so I focus a whole lot, and that's why it's called child care or care coordinator. I work a lot with children that have been taken away from their homes. And it's not appropriate, but if I tell you a whole lot of the stories and what some of these children have been through, for when I first started, um, I had to speak to a colleague and I go, I don't think I can stay in this place. You read some of these things and what we call vicarious trauma, um, it, it just... And this is not even meeting the child. This is just reading the reason why the child had to be taken away from home, you know, or from their home. And then you go, how on earth would any parent let the child go through this or do this to this child? Or, you know, some of the things that the children have been exposed to at a very early age, you know? You read that and then you go, and then this colleague goes, spot on, you're right. But that I also have to go, I, I need to change my perception and go, these children are survivors. They've been through all this and they're still alive. Awesome. awesome. And, and that for me was a very, was a, was a very pivotal, or what we call pivotal um, point in my, in, my, in my job. Or it's it just really changed everything, especially my career-wise. Now, mm-hmm. one of the things though that, that just causes that, oh, I would do this again and again, is when you see that change. So one of the kids I'd worked with, probably the longest I've worked with, was a child that had attempted suicide three times. Now, just imagine a 13-year-old three times already. That should break anybody's heart. Now, the question is, what is the child saying? Mm. One, I'm not wanted in this world, and there's really no need. And you see where the point's coming about that safety and all that. Now, I can't go I can't go into the reason why the child has done it. So the child had taken away and then we placed the child in a home where there was an attuned adult. In six months, right, we were interviewing an interview. The government had one of the government staff. I, I, we did a conference call talking to the child just to find out how the child was doing. And the child was saying things about, wow, I feel very confident in myself. 
That's what the child in six months, a child that I had, uh, that had already attempted suicide three times because I'm confident in myself. I, I love it. I enjoy my school. I love the people I'm meeting. I've made more friends. Uh, why? Just because there was an attuned adult mm -hmm. or adults to meet that. Can you see how it's so important that I, I get, I know the pressure guys. And for people listening, I understand the pressure. I really do understand the pressure of the financial implication of life generally, especially as cost of living just rises. If you're staying in the West, it's even a whole lot more because, you know, bills, the kind of bills that you get here is just the next level. I get that need for that. But unless we are deliberate about taking time to work with those kids, to invest in our children, honestly, guys, this, this, I dare say it's, it's so hard. Can I just add this here? Um, so just quickly answer your question. So for me, what makes me wake up in the morning and go, I need to continue to do this is because I've seen the difference in some of these children. I've mm -hmm. seen them grow and I go, oh my goodness, this is so beautiful. What I see is great. Mm -hmm. And so with that, you know, with that, you just go worth it, totally worth it. So that's the difference. Now, I just want to quickly add this. And I know you didn't ask the question. It is worth, it is really, really worth the time either. Okay. So culturally, as Africans, you know, when we go, it takes a village to raise a child. Mm. It's what we do for real. Like, I know it's changing, but I remember when we were growing up on the streets, I remember when we stayed on the street. It was a very poor neighborhood, but everybody knew, everybody knew whose child I was, right? Mm. And we would say something. If you see a child misbehaving, we go, or uh, something like, I'm trying to translate this in my language, know the child of whom you are. Yes. Yes, uh, yeah. For people back home, probably understand what I'm, yeah, what I'm saying. Know the child of whom you are, and you know, and and the whole bit. You can see somebody on the street that is not related to. We all call everybody older than you, auntie and uncle, right? That's part mm -hmm. of that. And I know it's not, it's not right. You know, it's not exactly right to call everybody right and uncle because that's that. But it's fine because there's this assumed responsibility that came from almost everybody as well. If yeah. you see the child is behaving, what's come here, come here. I, I know your dad, come here. Why would you do it? Oh, yeah, head home, you know, yeah. and all those things. And it, what we don't understand is that it's it actually helps, it actually helps the children, it helps our kids because yeah. safety then moves away from only just the home yeah. into the community. Yeah. That as long as I'm in this community, and that's why places like church, for example, yeah. matters for kids. If if you yeah. do, if you do, if you're into that, that's great. And it's awesome because not only do they find the safety, and I know the, the argument would be, yeah, but a number of children are not safe in church as well. I agree, and that is something that we, it's not permissible in any way. But the truth is that greater number of children are actually safe in churches, are safe in churches and most of this community or mosque or wherever it is that you are. Mm -hmm. And so the point is that safety then moves away, not just from the small micro home, but even into a bigger community. And so it's very important that we expose our children in any way that we can to, to those co healthy communities where the yeah. child can also find safety. Yeah. Because it actually does take a village to raise a child. Yeah. You know? yeah, I just thought to put that in that. That's very important. Wow, fantastic. Right, and healthy communities. Fantastic. This has been an amazing one. Healthy communities, attuned adults, you know, being sensitive, understanding the uniqueness of the child, you know, um, learning, improving, safeguarding, creating an enabling environment, man, a lot of important knowledge. So we'd like to just round off this by saying, can, tell us your last word in terms of, you know, what advice would you put out there for parents, you know, mm -hmm. any last word from your end? I promise I'll make it short. I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the bit. That's the um, I don't know if it was you I was talking to or if I said that at the very beginning, that one of the great quests of all the a number of the sciences, especially the human sciences, was derived from this bit of how can we be better parents? Mm -hmm. So we have a whole lot of theories that come, Erickson's and a whole lot of them, even the friend, Freud, Sigmund Freud that most of us talk about, and a whole lot of these great theory, um, theorists. Um, all, you know, all came up because of this key question, how do we become now? I want all our parents here to say to this, there is no perfect parent. There is no, per that's none at all. There's nothing like per the perfect parent. In fact, the whole game of parenthood allows you to miss it once in a while. As long as we are 
reflective enough to know that, oh, this is not okay. This is not right. Okay, how do I correct? How do I then quickly just try to, you know? And so, and that's hope because if parents there feel, or oh, because I missed the early stages, okay, I was beating my child all through. So maybe I've already thought the child dead. And, and no, that's not true. There's a, there's a part in, the, um, this is old Joel, uh, this is old, um, pro, not prophet, well, it's a prophecy book that it says, I will restore the years that the canker worm, the palma worm, the locusts have eaten. And again, this is for me one of my greatest Bible verses, you know? One of the things that he says is that I will restore years. Now, locusts and all those things do not eat years. They eat fruits. Mm. But God is saying, I would restore years to you. And that is time, mm. right? And all mm. the things that time can come with. And, and, and it's just something I want everybody to know that, look, you can, there is healing. It can, if a child doesn't have the best upbringing, I think now there's, everything is all scattered now. And this child is bringing behaviors that are just so horrible. It can be changed. Healing. Mm. Safety. You create safety and you would see what healing only happens in a safe place, just so you know. Mm. And so that is that should be okay. How can I make this place safe? Or can I make life safer for my child, irrespective of the age and whatever that means? Mm. And so that's 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 my last word. Awesome. That's such a uh, message of hope. There's no Absolutely. point beating ourselves up. Absolutely. We just get um, get us get up again and keep going, Absolutely. knowing that years will be restored. It doesn't matter how bad it's been or how good it's been, it can still be great. <laughs> yes. And thank you so much. It's been a phenomenal time with you. We have gleaned so much, so much from um all you have shared. And thank you to everyone who's joined us. You made it really, really interesting. And to everyone who contributed in the chat box, thank you so much. Um, we are so excited about doing this. Feel free to subscribe to our channel if you haven't. Foundation for Family Affairs. We have loads of healthy, great content for you. Thank you for joining us again. Do you Thank want you. to say something to them before we go? Well, I just want to appreciate all of you. I can see comment from Relationship Builders Forum. Yes. I can see comment from... Uh, Pastor Lally. Lally, Lally. Uh, Lally, thank Trump, you for you joining know, us. And thank you, Stephen, for making a comment. And for the rest of you that joined, we really want to appreciate you. We really want to appreciate you. So take care of yourself. And thank you so much uh, uh, to our <laughs> great guest. Yes. You've been phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal. And you did justice to the time. You shared yes. so much within the time. Yes. We appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yes. We'll see you on the other side. And to everyone, please stay tuned. Bye-bye. <laughs> Have a good evening. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.